The electricity you feel in the air tells you one thing. It's Thursday night, and this is Fantasy Football Live. We are going to all the way up to the kickoff of the game. Get your lineups ready. We're going to preview Thursday night. We're going to preview the whole weekend of action. We're going to make sure that your lineups are set now for the entire week of action. I'm Jason Fitz, hanging out with Andy Barons and Matt Harmon. You know the crew. You know how to get involved. Hashtag ask. FFL, the biggest question in the world, guys. Who's bigger, the NFL or Taylor Swift? Andy, like, what is this really a debate? We can all agree Taylor Swift is bigger than the NFL, correct? I can't, I can't tell you how great it was uh, that my hometown team just got pounded into dust last week while literally the most famous person in the world was <laughs> aggressively enjoying every second of it uh, on hand. So things are things are going well in my football world for sure. Uh, 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 Harmon, are we a, are we a Swifty over there, Harmon? A little uh, haters gonna hate, 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 hate. Listen, I'm not gonna hate on Taylor Swift. I'm not gonna be the guy that comes here and be like, actually, this extremely popular artist is really bad, and this is why you should know that. No, uh, listen, some of her stuff comes on. I'm probably getting down to it. I mean, am I seeking it out? No, but if it's on. I'm into it. I'm happy that she's got this whole thing going with the NFL. It's just been nothing better than, you know, seeing Swifties out there, like, try to figure out football. You know, is Travis Kelsey good for Taylor? Is she bad for Taylor? Hey, uh, I'm just really <laughs> curious, like, you know, what this I – mean, is she going to be at every game? Andy, I mean, she's definitely got to be disappointed what she saw on Sunday with the Bears. But now she gets the Jets this week. I mean, if she still likes Travis Kelsey in football after these next two weeks, I think it's time to call this thing, uh, like, official here. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, just glad she's not again. following the Bears around the country. I'm glad she's the Jets problem this week. I mean, let's be honest. She's bigger than the NFL. The numbers show she's bigger than the NFL. These are all true things. Also, if you write the headline, gloriously famous pop star goes to NFL game. I don't know why we care. I'm just saying, I'm just not like, I don't really care who she dates, who she doesn't date. All right, there's nothing I love more than Ram. So. It's time to look at our fantasy game changers for this week, powered by Ram Trucks. All right, you guys know what the deal is here. We give you words that are just synonymous with Ram Trucks and their overall kickassery, and then you give me a player that you associate with that word. Matt, I'm going to give you the first word. The first word is fast. Ooh, yeah, when I think fast, you know, like you're flying down the road and you're Ram. Uh, you know, he's been flying down the field very fast for the Houston Texans. It's rookie receiver Tank Dell. This guy has been on fire the last two weeks. Team high, 33% share of the air yards, 17 targets. He's averaging over 18 yards per catch again the last two weeks. Um, he's just been awesome. Having, having Noah Brown leave the lineup, unfortunately, due to injuries, it's, it's opened the door for Tank Dell, and he really hasn't looked back. You guys know I love Nico Collins as their X receiver. Like, Tank Dell's given him a lot playing all three positions, but he does primarily line up outside just like Nico. And look, the Steelers' defense is very good. That pass rush with TJ Watt is awesome. High, Highsmith is very good, too. That could be a bit of a mismatch with the banged-up offensive line down there in Houston. But outside receivers have still been able to get over on the Steelers' defense. Brandon, you've got him for 129 yards and two scores in Week 1. Amari Cooper got 90 yards on seven catches. Devontae Adams with your beloved Raiders. Fitz obviously had a monster game on Sunday Night Football. And even Jacoby Myers, one of my dudes, uh, 85 yards on seven catches as well. So I think Nico Collins and Tank Dell are sh set up to shine against the Steelers' defense. One Tank Dell nugget everybody should hear. And if you don't listen to inside coverage with me and Jory Epstein and, uh, and Charles Robinson, you should. But one nugget that he put out there that I thought was interesting is that Tank Dell was drafted in part because when they talked to C.J. Stroud, C.J. Stroud said, you need to go get that guy. It's just a reminder of, like, the, the organization did all the things the right way. Andy, your word. This is perfect for you. Premium. Yeah, I'm going I'm going Alvin Kamara for premium. Uh, I could have gone luxury here. I could have gone versatile here. A lot of good adjectives apply to Kamara. Um, I'm not... I'm, I'm not sensing enough enthusiasm from the fantasy community about his return. Uh, it's not like he's coming back from injury. This is a guy coming back from a short suspension. 
Um, he also averaged 92 and a half scrimmage yards per game last season. He caught 57 passes. Like, no, he's not used exactly as he was in the Drew Brees era. We're probably not getting an 80 catch pace out of him. Um, but this is still a great player. Also, it's not as if he got Wally pipped by Kendra Miller or Tony Jones Jr. while he was out. Um, he's coming back to full usage. That was that was pretty clear, I thought, during the summers that they intend to use Alvin Kamara as their, their full workload, you know. Uh, almost every situation sort of running back. He, he gets a Tampa Bay run defense this week that isn't the greatest matchup, but they've also just, they've not quite been a stone wall this season. They're giving up 4.2 yards per carry. So a pretty good spot for Kamara. Tons of work ahead of him. Again, I think he's a premium fantasy option. All right, Matt, let's go with another word here. Trustworthy, trustworthy. Yeah, I mean, ironic, the Lions are playing today and I'm somehow saying that DeAndre Swift is trustworthy Woo! and i really believe it what a world what a world here in week four of the nfl season and really look i think deandre swift has been extremely good like i think he has looked good in isolation the last couple of weeks but more importantly i mean yo this is the most effective this is the most juicy this is the best rushing ecosystem in the nfl right now the eagles rank number one in the league in rushing success rate deandre swift has been just running hard into cavernous openings created by the Eagles offensive line. Like, I don't know. I think Fitz might even be able to gain like three yards of carry. Just just three, maybe two, <laughs> maybe two and a half yards of carry behind Jason Kelsey and the boys there in Philadelphia. I, I really trust DeAndre Swift's workload right now. He's been awesome on their zone rushing scheme. Looks like, I mean, guys, DeAndre Swift is trustworthy. I, I think I believe it, as weird as it is to say. Uh, I, I'd give myself two and a half, three yards once. Uh, I, I, I'd need help getting off the field afterwards, but I think we should make this happen. Like, like an episode of Always Sunny, like the three of us just go to the Eagles and we try out and see how it goes. Uh, speaking of things that are trustworthy, and uh, yeah, no, it wouldn't go well. Uh, one thing I know that always goes well, Ram trucks. No matter what you're looking for in a light duty truck, the 2023 Ram 1500 got you covered. Score yours at Ram. Com. Okay, you guys know that you can be part of this conversation. You know how to have fun with us. It's all you got to do is hashtag AskFFL. We're going to do some make your pick. We're going to get in some thoughts for some users and figure out if you guys can help with some of these uh, user-submitted social media requests. We'll start with Carrie. Uh, she's the first one up, says, need two full PPR. James Cook, Derek Henry, Kyron Williams, DeAndre Swift, Ask FFL. I'll throw to Harmon here since you were just talking about uh, DeAndre. How do you feel about this one? Oh, no. This is a really hard question. Why do you have to throw it to me? Now, now, now I actually have to <laughs> believe what I just said. Um, very unfair. I do believe, though, that DeAndre Swift is the best option here. It's PPR. We haven't even seen him fully unleashed yet in the past game. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen um, in this Eagles offense. Like, if you're Jalen Hurts, you're not getting the DeAndre Swift portion, like the check down part of the playbook. You're either throwing to the outside receivers or you're taking off running. Uh, but still, I think he is a really good option here against Washington. He's just can't bench him at this point as long as he has this lead back role in this rushing ecosystem i'm very torn here between derrick henry and james cook but god forgive me i'm gonna go with james cook here i'm very concerned at this point that tennessee's offensive line is going to be dead weight for the entire season uh and derrick henry's on the injury report this week which just gives me a little bit of a tiebreaker to james cook here this again if if he was getting goal line looks he'd be like the third best back in fantasy right now he's not but i still think that gives you a pretty solid floor now i'm, I'm still worried about derrick henry's uh, split right now too like it just feels like they're using spears more than any of us thought all right let's get to the next question from Kristen. Kristen says i need two full ppr Bijan robinson hn moss pacheco thanks guys hashtag ask ffl barons what do you got on this one Okay, well, first of all, I feel like I feel like Bijan Robinson is has sort of graduated out of these questions. Um, I think you really need one because I think Bijan is is a pretty clear RB one for your team. Um, it's tough. It's tough to sit Achan off of a 233 scrimmage yard, four touchdown game that is probably going to be the highest scoring fantasy week that anyone has all season. Um, but we do have Waddle coming back. We have a somewhat more difficult matchup. Not that it matters for a Death Star offense like that. Um, I this. Boy, I'm uncomfortable about this, but I think I'm gonna go Zach Moss. Um, Zach Moss has a full workload. Um, he has he has weird advanced analytics behind him right now. He's like the missed tackle leader in all of football. He's playing extremely well. Um, nobody pushed 
him on that current roster, at least until we resolve the, the Jonathan Taylor fiasco. So he's getting a full workload. He's at home. Uh, again, he's playing really well. All right, we're going to keep him coming. You guys keep him coming. Hashtag Ask FFL. You know the drill. In the meantime, you also know that every single week, Sal Vetri offers up unique fantasy advice here on this show. Let's take a look at Sal's seven key findings for week four. Welcome back to the key findings for week four. And hey, I'm happy to have you here. Let's dive in. Finding number one is the best spot of the week. And this takes us to Miles Sanders, who quietly has one of the best roles in football. And through three games, he leads all running backs with 18 targets. We are currently getting the workhorse usage out of Sanders that we were promised multiple times this offseason. Sanders has played 61% of the Panthers snaps and averaged an elite 19.7 opportunities per game. Now this week, Sanders is going to face the Vikings 27th ranked run defense. He's a must start and he's actually a top five projected running back for me finding number two is the sketchy spot of the week and this takes us to the browns running back jerome ford who in his debut as the starter last week played 55 percent of the snaps and had over 19 fantasy points but there are a few concerns here first kareem hunt in a game where he was on a snap count saw 36 percent of the non-garbage time opportunities last week and the second issue is his matchup is brutal this week against the ravens number two run defense baltimore is allowing just 3.7 total yards per touch to opposing rb to make matters worse this game has the lowest projected total on the week at just 41 points finding number three is something to watch and what you want to watch is the rookie out of seattle zach charbonnet's usage and this usage has been easy to overlook because kenneth walker ranks third in running back fantasy points right now but walker has actually seen his snaps decrease for three straight games he only played 49 percent of the snaps last week while zach charbonnet the rookie snaps have increased each week in week three charbonnet played 44 percent of the snaps and handled 100 percent of the two minute offense for the second straight game and believe it or not charbonnet has been twice as efficient as Kenneth Walker on the ground this year. This is still Walker's backfield for now, but Charbonnet should not be available in 45% of Yahoo leagues. Finding number four is a player who is trending up. And this player is Brees Hall, who is slowly emerging at the exact same time the doctors predicted he would. Hall saw significantly more usage in week three, playing 48% of the snaps and handling nearly 60% of the rushing attempts. Now it's not quite full steam ahead for Hall because the Jets are still using three RBs. But here's the good news. Hall's usage is actually trending up. And now this week, he's a 14-point underdog to the Chiefs, so that's not great, but he has awesome matchups moving forward. He'll face the Broncos, Chargers, Raiders, and Giants run defenses that all rank bottom 10 as of now. Finding number five takes us to the pickup and play of the week. And this isn't a sexy option, but it's Matt Breida who saw great usage in week three. With Saquon out in week three, Breida played 80% of the snaps and handled all of the two-minute offense work. Now, his stat line wasn't crazy, just 18 total yards on seven touches. He did find the end zone, but this was against the number one defense in the 49ers on a short week. This week, he'll face the Seahawks 20th ranked tackling unit, and this is the second best game environment of the week with a total of 47 points. Saquon Barkley admitted to suffering a high ankle sprain, which typically takes three weeks to return from. If he's out, you can start breeding. Finding number six is do not panic. And you don't want to panic over Ramondre Stevenson, despite his interesting usage from week three. Stevenson saw a season low 65% of the snaps and did not play any of the two minute offense snaps. Now, despite this usage, he still earned 22 opportunities in a bad weather game against against the good Jets defense. But it was actually Ezekiel Elliott whose usage increased, playing a season high 38% of the snaps and earning 87 yards on 17 touches. But if you watch this game, Ramondre Stevenson had a key drop in this one. So maybe that's why he lost the two minute offense snaps because before this, he saw 95% of that usage the past two games. Overall, Stevenson is still playing 71% of the snaps this year and averaging an elite 19.3 opportunities per game. Finding number seven is the new number one overall wide receiver. Keenan Allen is my number one projected receiver for this week, and he's a top 10 player the rest of the season. Keenan Allen has earned 33% of the Chargers targets this year, top three in the NFL, and that includes Mike Williams playing eight quarters. Now, it's difficult to say that Allen's usage will increase with Mike Williams out for the year because he just saw 20 targets, but if anything, it will become more consistent. And since Justin Herbert took over in 2020, Keenan Allen has played five games without Mike Williams and averages 15.7 fantasy points in 10 targets per game. So these are the key findings for week four, and all that you have to do now, like you do every single week, is take this information and smack around your league mates with it. You guys can get in on this conversation. It's awesome in the Yahoo Fantasy app. These are some of the biggest uh, running back conversations that are going on out there. We got some Mostert talk. We got Henry. It seems like he always gets a slow start, only come back to be a rushing leader. His wrath and anger must build from Hank Jr. I, I, that one's pretty uh, pretty scary. Also, some thoughts on Conjure Miller. Like, we talked about Henry a minute ago, guys, but Andy, I mean, there is some element of – as angry as he gets, if he's running behind just an awful, awful line, I don't know what we really expect. 
Yeah, listen, if you're not concerned about that entire offense, then you're not paying a lot of attention, right? Because if the offensive line just fails week after week, um, then the whole house of cards can fall. Uh, and Derrick Henry's not impervious to that, especially an injured version of Derrick Henry. He's dealing with a toe issue right now. That's a concern. Um, wonderful player, incredible career. There's, there's nothing more fun in the NFL than watching Derrick Henry stiff arm somebody like in the open field. That's as good as it gets. Um, but he's not really getting a lot of open field opportunities right now because the line isn't clearing anything for him. It's a it's a tough spot. And then, as you mentioned earlier, um, Tajay Spears is, is playing uh, kind of an uncomfortable amount. And that might be injury related. It might just be that they want to reduce wear and tear. But man, um, he's facing a lot of headwinds right now, most of them from within his own team. Yeah, the most uncomfortable thing is just watching that Titans offense right now. I'm just saying, okay, so let's help everybody here and just remind everybody early, Harmon. Like, early is the key word because this weekend starts the three straight weeks of London games, 9.30 a.m. Eastern, 6.30 a.m. on the West Coast, right? Like, you got to get up early on Sunday. You got to get your lineup set on Sunday. Hey, this is an early game, so everybody needs to start thinking about this one early. And Harmon, when you look at that London matchup and you got the Falcons taking on the Jacks, what what are you looking for in that one? Man, I, I just want the Falcons to be normal, like for once, <laughs> please. Right? Is that too much to ask for? They're just the weirdest team in the entire NFL. And part of me thinks um, that Arthur Smith enjoys being weird. Like you can't tell me that he doesn't enjoy this whole, like, yeah, that's not fantasy football or whatever. But at the same time, Arthur, like we need these guys to be scoring a little more points. This offense needs to be more consistent. Sneakily. The thing I'm watching in this game is the Falcons offensive line. Yeah. Take your eye off the ball and watch the offensive line here. Come on. Like let's pay attention. Fantasy players. The Falcons right now rank fourth in sack rate allowed and our PFS 23rd rank pass blocking efficiency unit. And that's a surprise for a team that spent a lot of resources to retain their own guys in the offensive line room. They drafted an offensive lineman this year. Like this was supposed to be a strength of the team, but so far that has compounded the issues with Desmond Ritter so far. But on the good side here, uh, if you watch Doug Peterson's postgame press conference from last week, he was kind of like at a loss for words when they asked him, why aren't you rushing the passer better when you've added all these resources via the NFL draft and free agency to rush the passer? So maybe we get a stoppable force, movable object effect here, and we see a normal version <laughs> of the Falcons offense. Is that too much to ask? I don't know. Yeah, yeah probably. Uh, but And I will say, like, I hear all of this. Well, he doesn't care about fantasy football. I think we have to remember like the correlation causation thing. Like there is this element of the reason that some of these players are highly ranked in fantasy is because they're perceived to be great football players. So maybe don't make it about fantasy. Just make it about getting great football players the ball. All right, Andy, what are you looking for in this one? Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to people actually watching some Trevor Lawrence because I got to say, he's one of the most asked about players in the game right now. Uh, I, I see it in my feet all the time. Harmon and I on the podcast were talking about it because everybody asked about Trevor Lawrence and the Jaguars offense. Um, I got to tell you, I think he's just a screaming buy in fantasy right now, especially if you're struggling at quarterback. It, to, to my eye, he is making wow throws absolutely every week. He's made actually, according to PFF, the second most uh, big time throws so far this season. That guy's got an arm um, and he has been fun to watch. The problem so far, one of the problems is, is that Jacksonville receivers have nine drops on the on the year officially, uh, four of them by Calvin Ridley, several of which had they been caught um, would have us all feeling really great about Lawrence. I think he's playing extremely well. Uh, you look at two weeks ago against Kansas City, Jacksonville receivers had, I don't know, four or five like college touchdowns where they got one foot down in the end zone, couldn't get the other foot down. So I think this is noise right now. And I, I think we've got a really good chance of a Trevor Lawrence breakout here. So I, I'm going to give you something I'm looking for that ties into that. And it's, can we trust the very weapons you were just talking about? Because, you know, I'll go back to my buddy, Brent Martineau down in Jacksonville has covered the team for years. I talked to him and I said, okay, what, what, what have you seen from the Jacks this year? And he said, everything last year had a moment where it looked easy and it had rhythm. Nothing this year has rhythm. So, you know, to your point that Trevor Lawrence is making these incredible throws. Well, he's having to make these incredible throws because everything's just a little off for Jacksonville. I don't know why, like there were high expectations for the Jags. And so far there's nothing that they're doing as dominant as we expected. I had huge expectations for Calvin Ridley. I have huge expectations for the weapons in general that they have there for Jacksonville. And it's not clicking. So I don't know if that's time on task 
I don't know if that's a quarterback relationship with the receivers. I don't know if it's not comfortable with the offensive line, but something's off. And I keep looking at it to your point and saying, when it comes together, it should be a beautiful, wonderful thing. But it just doesn't look natural so far to me. I, maybe that, you, you have a smirk, and tell me if I'm wrong, Andy. It, it just doesn't look that natural to me. Isn't that, isn't that terrible that my natural face is just a smirk? Uh, you're not the only person who said it. I've heard it before. <laughs> I've heard it before. Um, no, I get it. But this is like, it's part of what I'm getting at, right? They're just like a half second off on so many things. And, and I, I will say, in fairness, Calvin Ridley looks like a guy who's missed most of the last two years, right? Like, he was spectacular in the first half against Indianapolis. And we were all like, oh, he's back. He's the old Calvin Ridley. And then these last couple of weeks, it has just not been the same. I mean, he dropped a beautifully thrown long touchdown just last week um, that would have been a total highlight play that you would have seen anywhere. But uh, it, his hands aren't functioning necessarily as as expected right now. I would, you know, and, and Matt has talked about this extensively, like for the most part, drops are really pretty random. And, and obviously Calvin Ridley gets himself open and he's going to continue to be fed targets. So we just need this to start to click pretty soon. And, and fear not, one of my best friends told me years ago, I have resting disinterested face, and he's not wrong. I'm, I just always look disinterested in everything. I can't help it. All right. I'm interested in Popeyes. Let's now take a look at our sweet and spicy picks presented by Popeyes. Just like Popeyes' new sweet and spicy wings are the perfect combination of flavors, we're looking at the top dual threat players in this weekend's slate of games. Let's we'll stick with Andy. We're making you do all the work right now. What are you looking at for this one? Yeah, I'm looking at Miles Sanders. Uh, you just heard Sal talk about him a few minutes ago. Um, Miles Sanders, and this is kind of wild, he actually leads all running backs in targets as of this moment. Um, he's only he's only caught 12 of them because he's Miles Sanders, but still, it's pretty noteworthy. Um, and it's not just a function of like one big game either. He's seen at least five pass attempts come his way every week so far this season. This week, Carolina gets Minnesota, and that defense ranks 27th in total yards allowed. They rank 26th in scoring. Uh, they allow 120 rushing yards per week, a little bit over that. So it is a it is a blow up spot for Sanders. And again, his usage is such that you know even if the run isn't necessarily in play, he's going to see the football. Hasn't been incredibly efficient on the ground to this point, but he's also had some pretty rough matchups. So I think he's a sneaky good start. And again, doesn't matter what direction that game goes, he's going to see the football a lot. I'll, uh, I'll give you a quick one here that makes me look like a complete hypocrite, but hear me out. I'm going with ETN, right? Like, if we're talking about dual threats, I just mentioned the offense for Jacksonville has looked completely out of sorts. It's Everything's been a little bit off. The less they can rely on their wide receiver rep weapons, the more they will continue, in my mind, to rely on the running back that they can rely on. He gets all the targets. He gets the rushes. He's going to have opportunities. And if the wide receivers can't play more consistent as a whole group, they will simply lean on the one weapon they can rely on, which is ETN. So even in an offense that's been out of rhythm, I like the dual threat opportunity that Travis ETN will bring against the Falcons. Matt, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I'll bring up Michael Pittman here because I feel like he's another one of these guys that was drafted a little bit later, was really drafted, I think, below where his floor was always going to be this season. So you still get a lot of like questions about, ah, should I play Michael Pittman? I, I think you play this guy every single week. He's top five in the NFL in targets right now. And I think he's a dual threat player because he's been used on sort of these short routes so far, like quick hitting stuff. And, and that is something that he's really good at doing. I've been talking about this for years. Like he's a big receiver, but he gets open on like slant routes and curl routes and dig routes and crossing routes. He's really very, very good as a separator against man coverage and zone coverage on those short underneath in breaking routes. Like he can do that stuff. But you also saw last week against the Ravens, a little reminder that this dude Dude, when you want to throw to him in tight coverage for like a big contested situation, he can do that stuff too. Like that was what he was making his money on with Carson Wentz a few years ago. And I think Anthony Richardson is going to be a much, much better player in the long term than Carson Wentz. We get Anthony Richardson back this week. I think we're finally going to see these guys hook up on some more downfield throws in a game like against the Rams that I think could get relatively high scoring here. 46 projected point total. Um, I like Michael Pittman a lot as a dual threat in this matchup. Thanks, folks. Don't forget, got to grab a Popeye sweet and spicy wing combo with an ice cold Coca-Cola for tonight's game and every other game, too. Just head over to Popeyes.com or the Popeyes app to place an order for pickup or delightful delivery. All right, so we're going to take another deep dive with a special guest from around the fantasy community. This week, we got Matt and Lawrence Jackson from NBC Sports are looking at some optimal flex plays. Take it away, guys. 
All right, Lawrence, shout out. Uh, appreciate you joining us here. And look, man, what a what a name to get it started off with. The year is 2023, and you're on the show to hype up one Adam Thielen. Tell me why. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's crazy, right? It's uh, but but we gotta do it, man. We dealing with uh, we dealing with injuries here, right? We just lost uh, Mike Williams to the season, so if you're looking for a receiver to throw in there, man, a nice little flex play will be the uh, will be Adam Thielen going up against this Vikings defense, who. You know, we saw what how they fared against the Chargers last week, and you got Thielen coming off two straight weeks where he's seen at least uh, 10 targets. He's got 18 receptions, 199 yards, and two touchdowns in his past two games. So he didn't get off to a fast start, but, you know, the last two games he's been doing good, and he's done it with Bryce Young, and he's done it with Andy Dalton this week. He'll get back uh, the rookie and Bryce Young, so he should be ready to light up that uh, Vikings defense. And, and, and on a lower scale, too, I would even say DJ Chart. Mm, mm. Hey, look, a little revenge for the old man Adam Thielen here in week four. Lawrence yeah, is yeah. calling it out. They said, Yo, Lawrence. They're like, you let me go for, for Jordan Addison? I'm about to show y'all something right, right now. Love to see it. Well, hey, uh, I know you know ball. And that's why you've got Jacoby Myers here. I, look, I love Jacoby Myers. Big fan of him as a route runner. Tell me why you like him here in week four. Yeah, well, again, like how I just talked about this Vikings defense. Well, uh, there's a team who's right on par with that Vikings defense, and that's the Chargers defense who we saw them against the Vikings. An incredible shootout there, right? Now, you're gonna, you're gonna, there's going to be a little worry. So there's a little worry there if there's no Jimmy G, but... You know, Jimmy G's Jimmy G. Jimmy G just threw three picks, man. Uh, you know, so Jacoby Myers here, he missed week two. But in week one, he came out gangbusters, two touchdowns, missed week two, comes back and has another nice game. In the two games that he's played, he saw at least, he's seen at least 10 targets, right? And so in those two games, 16 receptions, 166 yards, two touchdowns. And think about this too, Matt. This game between the Chargers, we know they could score, but then we're talking about the Raiders, right? The over-under on this game is 47 and a half, so Jacoby Myers is going to have is gonna have room to eat here as well. But they, they might not win the game, but he's going to do his numbers. Yeah, there's there's no chance they win the game, that's for sure. And, and <laughs> hopefully no Raiders fans are, are sharing the show with us. Yeah, I don't know if there are any, but... Yeah, uh, again, uh, I love the overlap there between the skill set of Jimmy G and, and Jacoby Myers. And Lawrence, look, the football gods have been too, too cruel for us already. Like, we don't need to be seeing Brian Hoyer starting games right now. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we, it, that's just, you know, that's a story we've seen all too many times. And that actually would bring down the value for both of these receivers, him and Devontae Adams, a little bit. But eh, not too much, you know, because, again, we're dealing with Jimmy G here. But Jimmy G is a longtime starter. And no matter how many interceptions he throws, that doesn't affect our receivers. Uh, hey, the football gods have shined on Zach Moss so far. This guy's been getting a ton of opportunity with Jonathan Taylor on the shelf. Um, you like him again this week. Yeah, yeah, definitely against the Rams who are, you know, middle of the road when it comes to uh, giving up fantasy points to running backs. But that's OK when you're Zach Moss and you've seen at least 22 touches in the first two games you've played this season. Of course, he was out week one. He comes in week two and is immediately the uh, workhorse back there, like you said, in the absence of Jonathan Taylor in his two games. One game, 107 yards for scrimmage. The next game, 145 yards for scrimmage against a good hurt team, but a good Ravens team. He uh, he was still able to do his numbers. And the biggest thing about this, I heard y'all talking about Michael Pittman and Anthony, Anthony Richardson. Anthony Richardson coming back is going to open up things for Zach Moss. That's why we're dying to see Anthony Richardson and Jonathan Taylor together because they'll both complement each other. But having Anthony Richardson there will make the defense have to play 11 on 11 football, whereas to, that's not really the case when you have Gardner Minshew. So if he was able to produce with the Gardner Minshew against the Ravens, then I like him in this spot against the Rams, especially with the volume he going to get. 
Yeah, hopefully all these Zach Moss truthers did not share uh, all their stock or sell all their stock, man, because he has been <laughs> incredible so far this year. Staying in that same game, you've got another guy on the other side that you like too. Yeah, definitely. Let's go with Tutu Atwell. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I'd probably be talking about Puka Nakua here, but he's more like a wide receiver too now, even after the down game in week three. But talk about Tutu here. This dude, we're going into week four. This guy's wide receiver 14. And when we're talking PPR, 16.8 fantasy points per game. Furthermore, this team really hasn't been able to run the ball. While Kyron Williams has gotten the volume as the number one back, they're not really, they haven't been efficient and they're not gaining uh, adequate yards. They're throwing the ball. Matthew Stafford is throwing it 42 times per game in these first three games. And as you saw, they're getting him involved also, not just the receiving game. They ran the little reverse with him where some people feel like he scored some, you know, the refs say that he didn't, but they're finding ways to manufacture him some touches. So he's definitely the number two option uh, in this passing attack right now. Puka Nakua first, Tutu Atwell second, and then Tyler Higby will be your, uh, will be your third option. So I like him in this spot as well. And no, oh, he, he even he still ended up scoring against the Bengals. So he would have had two touchdowns, right? So I, I, I like him in a flex spot this week. Yeah, hey, Tutu Atwell playing a critical role for that Rams offense rather quietly. Not so quietly, very, very importantly critical role, Lawrence Jackson uh, in the fantasy football community. Hey, appreciate your time, Lawrence. Thanks for joining us. Stick around a little bit. We're going to be doing some play calling here and answering the people's questions. Let's do it. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you say that. Like, I guess question number one comes from at Jason Fitz, who asks Matt Harmon, who hurt you? Like, yeah, throwing the shade at my beloved Raven. I'm just sitting here listening to a great interview and then realizing that we got beef. We got beef all day. Okay, let's get to the actual quest. We'll get to the real get to the real questions. Harmon and I will work this out in group therapy later on. Uh, the question number one comes from Brian. Says, Evan Ingram or Sam Laporta in PPR? Let's ask Laporta's biggest fan, Andy. What do you think? I, yeah, this is one of those situations where I almost feel like I should recuse myself. Um, I've, I've got Laporta as my number four tight end this week, and I, I feel I feel like that's maybe a little bit too conservative. Again, he, he's coming off a week in which he was the overall tight end one. He hasn't finished as anything other than a top 10 fantasy tight end in any week so far. So totally bankable. Um, Ingram, obviously, in a situation where he's, he's probably not the number one there. He's probably not the number two there. Um, Laporta is a pretty clear number two for Detroit. I think he has a really solid night here. All right, let's go to Lawrence on the next one. Dave asks this question, Justin Fields or CJ Stroud? Thanks. Uh, Lawrence, what do you think? Didn't think we'd be answering this question, especially this early in the season, but I'm going to actually go with Justin Fields right here. They're facing the Broncos. The Broncos are the worst defense against quarterbacks in fantasy. If Justin Fields can't get it right and get something going against the Broncos, then 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 we really in trouble. So I'm going to go Fields. All right, let's get the next one over to Harmon. This one comes in from Chris. This is a deep philosophical question. Are Brees Hall, Terry McLaurin, and Jerry Judy droppable at this stage, or should we stash a potential resurgence later in the season? Uh, yeah, very deep philosophical. This is the stuff that uh, the ancient Romans were trying to kick around back in the day. And, and oh, yeah. here's the deal, man. <laughs> um, no, look, if they're big name proven players, and I think two of these three guys are really good proven players, I uh, won't name who, who the third one is, but if you've been listening to the podcast, you, you definitely know who I'm talking. Yeah, Andy knows. Andy knows who I'm talking about. Yo, you don't, don't be going and dropping these guys because my main question back to you people is who are you dropping them for? Are you just dropping them for like the latest flavor of the week? You know, the one week person who's probably a fluke, probably not going to have sustainable uh, value. No, you don't want to be doing that. Okay. Especially for a guy like Brees Hall. I realize it's a miserable situation right now. You know, Zach Wilson, the whole thing, Joe Namath is calling out Zach Wilson. Joe Namath never says anything bad about the Jets, but again, I think over the course of the season, we could see Brees Hall's value rise. I think Terry McLaurin is way too good to drop. And Jerry Judy is a player for the Denver Broncos. So again, I, I think you can go ahead and hold all of these guys uh, and try and try to get some consistent value at some point. Don't just, don't just go dropping them for anybody. 
I, you know, earlier in the show, I oversimplified pop star goes to football game. Like, uh, really, we could just take the Joe Namath quote and sim- like simplify it. Like, guy that used to play football and is old and is a fan of the Jets yells about current team. I I don't know why it's such a big deal. I'm just saying, now the Jets fans will get my menchies. Let's get to the next one. This one goes to Lawrence. It comes from Black Mamba. Says, Matt Breida or Tyler Algier? What do you think? Start, sit. Yeah, and obviously this question is being asked with the assumption that Saquon Barkley won't play. I'm going to actually go with Matt Breida versus the Seahawks. Uh, He'll be the lead guy. He didn't get a lot of opportunities against the 49ers. They was ball dominant in that game. Tyler Algier working behind B. John Robinson. So just give me the guy for this week that's going to get the that's going to get the more that's going to get more touches. So I'll go with Matt Breida gritting my teeth at that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, not all these questions are pretty. Uh, we'll let the, we'll let Andy take the next one from Eric. Week four, should I start Jerry Judy or Mike Thomas at flex? Yeah, this one not especially pretty either. Um, and to to Matt's point on Jerry Judy, I, I think if he doesn't if he doesn't do something for you this week, then perhaps we can have a conversation about whether whether we can whether we can unload him. But man, the matchup against the Bears is just too is just too tantalizing. Um, the Bears came into the season known to be a bad defense, and they have since lost a couple of defensive backs. Right, so like. This is a, I I don't need to uh, tell anybody that there's a pretty ugly situation in Chicago right now. We're seeing receptions against the Bears where like there's nobody else in the camera frame. Um, I expect Jerry Judy to have a big week. I expect Russell Wilson to have a weirdly big week in this one. I I just don't think the Bears can stop an opponent right now. So I'd go Judy here. Uh, All right, let's get one more in here from Mitch. Mitch asks, after losing Mike Williams, I'm faced with starting either Tank Dell or Jacoby Myers as my wide receiver two and a half PPR. This is interesting to me because, Andy, you've had positive things to say about both of them. So who would you start? Yeah, let, like this is not a problem. I mean, I, I I know people are really wringing their hands over over the Mike Williams dilemma. But if your options are Tank Dell or Jacoby Myers, you, sir, do not actually have problems at all. Um, I like them both this week. I would love to squeeze Tank Dell into a lineup, but I would but I would play Jacoby Myers. Um, I, I think Jacoby Myers has more than passed the eye test so far. He's making... Like some of the catches that Jacoby is making that are that don't even count that are like out of bounds are just wow plays. So I, I think he's been great. Um, I'm definitely going with Jacoby. He's gonna go off when the Raiders, my beloved Raiders, beat the Chargers. Oh, it's gonna feel good when I come on next week. All right, thanks, Lawrence. We appreciate you hanging out with us. Be sure to follow him at Lord Don't Lose Lawrence. We appreciate you. One of this week's top ads in Miami's is Miami's running back, Devon Achan. And I apologize for years reading his, his highlights. I always said Achan. Turns out it's Achan. He explodes for 49.3 fantasy points. We're going to look at his viability for this week against the Bills a little later in the show. But in this week's Eckler's Edge, Austin explained what he's seeing from the Dolphins rookie. Check it out. He has his great contact balance. Like he would, he'd be getting bounced around. Like, yeah, I'm a light guy. So I know how it is out there. People see a light guy. They try to put a shoulder in you. They don't wrap you up and they just try to kind of nudge you down to the ground. And if you can sustain, sustain that, you're going to bounce off a lot of tackles. That's what I saw him uh, doing with, um, all of the uh, the DBs out there, where it was it would not one person would take him down. It would take multiple mm-hmm. people that had to get to the ball. Um, he wasn't just going down on, on first contact. And so, yeah, if you got speed, man, you know, and which is what their entire team's built off of. Guess what? In the run game, you're probably going to be running off tackle, throwing it. You know, there's going to be some up the middle stuff too. You got to keep a defense honest, but there's going to be a lot of misdirection. There's going to be a lot of how can we get our guys up to full speed because that's where we feel like we have the advantage. So it makes sense, um, you know, for him to have success in that type of offense. We're going to take a look at the injury report here coming out of practice today to see who we're monitoring for the weekend. We'll get to some of the biggest names here. Jalen Waddle, his cleared concussion protocol today, will return versus Buffalo. Austin Eckler, who you just saw on our show ankle limited in practice still questionable against the Raiders Debo uh, ribs and knee hasn't practiced this week Tyler Higby dealing with an Achilles injury uh, he's still uh, unclear on whether or not he's going to play so when you look at this list Matt is there somebody that stands out to you that's sort of panic mode for fantasy players well I think the Debo stuff is pretty concerning hasn't practiced yet uh, whereas Waddle you know he's cleared I feel really good about him against a zone heavy defense I think Austin probably has like maybe a 50-50 chance to play. I know he really wants to get back out there. Uh, But Debo, yeah, I think is the one that's really concerning here. And we know that if one of these guys in San Francisco is out of the mix, like the other two, Brandon Ayuk and George Kittle, in this situation would be like top 10 plays at their positions. 
Yeah, we'll keep an eye on that, obviously, as we keep going. And again, the reminder, there is a London game this Sunday. You must set your lineup earlier than you expect. I'm just going to remind everybody as we take you all the way through, through to kickoff here today. All right, let's get to the rookies because every year there's a ton of hype around rookies in the offseason. We want to take a look at how these players are faring for fantasy purposes in our rookie report card. Uh, guys, were we happy about report cards as a kid? Like, parents, were you, like, excited on report card day or were you nervous? Uh, no, uh, report card day was not an exciting day for me. I was not that kid. Um, it was usually fine. Sometimes we had to delay the delivery a bit, but it was, uh, they went okay. Harmon, uh, you were shaking your head. Not, not, a, not a report card guy? No, nah, see, obviously Andy went to school when we were still chiseling on like rocks, you know, and, and drawing on the cave walls. So, um, you know, he, he could potentially delay his parents finding it. For me, who's a younger, more sprightly, uh, you know, guy uh, than, than Andy is, they the report cards were going on the computer back in my day. So like, my mom was literally seeing the grades like for current projects that were going on. Uh, that was not a good time, buddy. No, report card day sucked. Uh, every day sucked. Because my mom, shout out to her, you know, the best mom alive. Uh, apologies to all the others out there. The best mom alive, the best mom ever. Uh, she was checking in on your boy, like, basically daily on what was going on in school, uh, which was not so good for me. Um, thank God this job worked out, because I don't know what the hell I'd be doing otherwise. Yeah, uh, by the way, I typed my papers in high school on a typewriter, because I'm also old. But the advantage that Barons and I had being old is that we could doctor our report cards, all right? That was the advantage back then. Like, you could take that letter if you had good handwriting. You could change that thing. All right, can't change these grades. We're going to give out some grades, and we'll start with one of the most talked about quarterbacks right now for his efficiency and proficiency so far. Matt, give us a grade on C.J. Stroud. Yeah, I think you got to give C.J. Stroud a grade that my mom never saw for me, which is a big, fat A-plus <laughs> so far. Because you look at C.J. Stroud, he has been awesome. He's been awesome in, like, critical areas you want to see quarterbacks thrive. Like, he's been really good in the intermediate area of the field. He leads all quarterbacks right now in passing yards between 10 and 19 yards. Like, that intermediate area of the field, that's crucial for, for any quarterback to be really good there, especially a young guy. Then you put on the context that – He's been doing this behind a makeshift offensive line. The run game hasn't been very good. Their defense has been sustaining cluster injuries, although I think they're out kicking expectations a little bit. And look, I love Nico Collins. I love Tank Dell. But these guys are not necessarily like household proven names or anything like that. So, yeah, I love uh, the fact that C.J. Stroud has been playing this well. A plus for C.J. Stroud. I like that. We're giving out good grades. Andy, what do you got for Jameer Gibbs? Oh, uh, well, I was something of a talented underachiever growing up, so I can tell you that this profile gets C's. Uh, and I think that's what I'm going to give Gibbs here. Uh, so, like, the last couple weeks have been fine, right? He had an, an 80 rushing yard game. He had a seven catch game. Those have been good. The problem we talked about at the top of the show, he doesn't, he doesn't have a defined role other than back up to David Montgomery. Um, he has not clearly been the third down guy. He's certainly not the goal line guy. He's not the two minute guy. Um, we need him to have some sort of responsibility that really feeds fantasy stats, and it hasn't been there yet. I think he's really good. He's forcing some missed tackles. Like, the highlights that we get have been super promising. But again, you go back to that opener, and it was mostly the David Montgomery show. If we see that again tonight, it's a problem for Gibbs. Uh, if he can't get up, like, if he's just going to be a pure rotational runner, he really needs to get up to something close to a 50% snap share. Yeah, and by the way, part of that's going to be where he was drafted, and part of it's going to be he's a running back, which means the clock starts the day you're there. Like, you got to start getting productivity out of him if you're not going to pay him, and that's real. All right, Matt, let's go to Zay Flowers, Baltimore wide receiver. What do you think? Yeah, I'm going to come down on a B here for Zay Flowers because I think Zay has been really, really, really good. You know, he's been getting some of those design looks, but you also see him winning on, like, big boy downfield NFL routes. Um, so he's checking a lot of boxes here. He, he's been getting open at will. He's explosive after the catch. Like he is very much up there on the he moves different rankings is Zay Flowers. I do remain the right to do what Andy uh, says here and like scribble this out and change it to an A 
very soon <laughs> if we get some more health around Zay Flowers in the Baltimore Ravens offense because I'm a little concerned that they're so banged up right now. Although we should note that I should not be doing any uh, letter changing. I could never have pulled that off because uh, one person on this show actually had to take remedial handwriting courses in the <laughs> sixth grade because he was so bad <laughs> at handwriting. And I'm sorry, Mrs. Cunningham of Grand Park Middle School, shout out. But it did not work. So uh, I can't change the letter grade, but I'm hoping that Flowers and the Ravens change his letter grade here in a couple weeks. Oh, I love that. That's amazing. Let's go to Jordan Addison for you, Andy. What do you got for a grade for Addison? Yeah, I'm gonna give him. I'm gonna give him an A minus here. Um, I think everything is just moving in the right direction for Addison. The snaps, the snap share, the targets, like literally everything is moving in the in the direction that we'd like to see it. He has a pair of touchdown receptions on the season. He's just carving up favorable coverage situations that are created in this offense because he's got Justin Jefferson on the field, and Justin Jefferson tilts the field in a way that few players do. Um, a dot for Addison is 12.9, so he's getting down field chances in an offense that right now is averaging 360 passing yards per game. So again, as the playing time goes up, I feel even better about him and he can move this A minus to an A. All right, let's go to another wide receiver. A lot of them in this year's draft. Matt, what do you think on Jackson Smith and Jigba? Oh gosh, guys, I, I have to give out a bad grade here and I'm giving JSN Woo! a D so far. Uh, and, and look, I, it's been about as bad of a start as you possibly could have imagined uh, for JSN. He's barely played, right? Uh, when he has played, it's only been these little like short dump off passes, fewer than three average depth of target on average right now for JSN. And look, some of this was to be expected. Uh, some of this was to be expected because he's got two great receivers in front of him. Like beating out DK Metcalf and beating out Tyler Lockett is a really, really tough job for a rookie wide receiver. So look, I think JSN is going to be a very good NFL player. I'm still very high on JSN, but purely from a fantasy grade perspective, you got to give him a D so far because he's barely playing. You certainly can't play him in fantasy. And I know people out there are thinking about dropping him, which I'm not endorsing, but I think we got to give him a D. All right, let's get one more in, and I think I know where this is going to go. And, like, uh, if Sam, Sam, he's our man. If he can't do it, nobody can. Sam Laporta, Andy, you get to give the grade on this one. Let's all sit in shock and awe. Yeah, listen, what, what else can we say about one of the best to ever do it? Um, the Laporta era in the NFL is off to a is off to an incredible start. You got you got actually got to think that Taylor Swift is kind of questioning her tight end choices at this point. Um, Sam Laporta has been a top 10 fantasy tight end every week he's been in the league. Uh, he was the overall tight end one last week. They are confident, totally confident running behind him. I, like we got to give this guy an A+. All right, I love that A+. Uh, you know what else I love? Oh, this segment that we're coming to now, it's called Primetime Picks. And you guys know the drill at this point. Primetime Picks, we go through the games. All right, I'm going to explain it before. Don't, uh, okay, we got the rankings there. I'm just going to explain to everybody that we go through Snake Draft. You can only pick the Thursday night game, the Sunday night, the Monday night. You got to pick one from each of them. Now, I bet you guys think I'm just going to sit here and talk my talk. I'm going to sit here and talk all sorts of smack. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to say this. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not saying anything. That's all I have to say. It's a little we are the champions for you. That's all. Oh. Uh, look at the standings. Uh, look at the standings. Uh, it's an important note here. We might be tied in the minds of many, but there's actually only one leader because the tiebreaker is total points. Uh, I'm sitting in first place. I'm sitting in first place. Worst to first. All right, go ahead. Now we got to pay. They're telling me we got to move on. All right, let's get to this week's pick. Because I was uh, first, I picked last. Matt goes up first. Matt, what do you got for us in this one? <laughs> I'm so upset. <laughs> I'm so upset that we just had to go on that trip to the Shire uh, just because Fitz, you know, won last week. How how unfortunate. Um, all right, so my Poor first pick shirt. here. And look, I realize my mistake from last week. It was that I let the worst game on the slate, which of course included the Raiders, should have thought of that. Uh, the worst game of the slate, I let that, get, that game go on too far. So I think the most 
uninspiring game on the slate here from a pure fantasy perspective is actually Chiefs versus the moribund, hopeless Jets. So I'm going to take a player from that game first because I'm just going to take the best player from that game, which is what I should have done with Devontae Adams last week. I'm going to go ahead and take Travis Kelsey as the first overall pick here. Yeah, I mean, Travis Kelsey, don't know if you've heard, he's very, very hot right now. I think he's going to be very, very hot in fantasy this week. All right, that means Andy's up next. What you got, Andy? Oh, I love thinking about Fitz as a resident of the Shire, kicking up his little bit feet at the end of the show every night. Um, I'm going to go I'm gonna go Monday nighter. I'm going to go Kenneth Walker. Uh, he has four touchdowns in his last two games. That's pretty good, right? Uh, unexpected receiving involvement this year, 20-plus touches last week. Uh, the Giants are giving up almost 140 rushing yards per game, so give me Walker. Okay, I like that pick a lot, actually. So I'm going to go to, I mean, I, I'm, I've got two straight picks here, so it doesn't really matter which order they go in. But I think the Lions Packers have the most options left for me at the end, and you guys are going to pick a bunch of times. So I'll go with DK Metcalf first uh, just to get one of the wide receivers, I think, can put up a bunch of points. And then as I come around the corner, I'm going to do the same thing with the turn. Garrett Wilson. I know Zach Wilson sucks but I got to get somebody out of the Sunday night football game. I don't trust any of the receivers for, for the chiefs. I just barely trust Garrett Wilson. I feel like if Zach Wilson could just get one ball thrown to Garrett Wilson near the end zone, I'll score some points. So that's the way I get to DK Metcalf, Garrett Wilson, back to back. Those are my picks. Andy, what do you think? All right. In the, in the probably shocking pick of the night, I'm not going to take Sam Laporta from the Thursday night game. Instead, I'm going to go Aaron Jones. Full endorsement of Aaron Jones tonight. He's returning. He's desperately needed by Green Bay, um, given how little the pack has actually gotten from its backfield these past two weeks. Um, Jones has been a top 12 fantasy running back in each of the past four seasons, and I expect him to return to that level of play. All right. That means, Matt, you're up. You got two in a row. What you giving us? A fraud or coward, which one describes Andy Barron's best after not <laughs> taking his guy, Sam Laporta? I'm going to take one of my guys. I'm on Ross St. Brown here from the Thursday night game. The dude's just a lock for volume every single week. We were worried last week. Oh, is he, is he banged up? Does he have turf toe? Well, he just goes over 100 yards like it's no problem. Guy's awesome. He'll be my second pick here. And coming around in round three, I will take Tyler Lockett. DK Metcalf on the injury report with a little, he's got a little rib situation going on. DK Metcalf, ooh, a little questionable there. So, yeah, the guy who leads the NFL in end zone targets right now it's Tyler Lockett against a blitz heavy man coverage defense I think Lockett has a big game on Monday night have you seen his abs like he bet like his ribs respond to his abs like he'll be fine uh, all right Andy what do you got for your next pick well we've already mentioned how dusty and ancient I am so I'm gonna I'm gonna draft this team like I'm drafting a fantasy team in like 1997 and I'm gonna go running back running back running back Give me Isaiah Pacheco uh, against the Jets. He just handled 17 touches coming off injury in week three. Actually has the fourth most rush attempts inside the 10 yard line so far this season. And that means I got the last pick. And here's the thing, above and beyond everything else, I think we can all establish I'm a troll and I've been listening to Fantasy Football <laughs> Live for weeks now. I got one pick left on the board and that pick has to come from Thursday Night Football, which means I have to pick Sam Laporta, right? Like I yeah, have do to it. pick Laporta here just so that I can do the, the, the double middle finger finger to Andy tonight when he puts up like 472 <laughs> yards in this game. And I can be like, I told you, saw it coming the whole way. I, you know, I, I don't know though. I think like so far, this is a hot take. Whoever picks first usually has a really good looking draft at the end. I feel like Matt, like America's, America's going to back Matt on this one. Matt, Matt, Matt's done it the right way. Andy's, and he's got a lot of running backs. I don't know. All right, you guys can chime in. Tell us how you think, how you feel. We'll be talking all the trash. It is important to note the standings are currently tied. Each of us has a win, so it's anybody's ball game. Look at what a difference it makes. All right, let's get to the fantasy face-off here. We're going to go through a little bit of fantasy face-off. We like to do this like an either-or sort of thing, give you a big player everybody's got their eye on. Andy, everybody's had their eye on Devon Achan, right? We all know that. I was lucky enough to have him in two of my leagues this week. So he's currently RB21 in consensus rank. So I'm going to give you the either or, A-Chan or James Conner. Yeah, listen, A-Chan, one of the most difficult players to rank, right? Because he's just another name, just another guy with blistering speed tied to that offense, and they get everybody back this week, obviously coming off the monster game. Um, James Conner has been the foundation of Arizona's offense, and they are coming off a great day in a difficult matchup against Dallas. Uh, he's had at least 70 total yards in every game. He is a little bit banged up right now, which I, you know, understandable coming off of uh, coming off of last week, but the workload has just been there week in, week out. I'm gonna go Connor here. 
All right, well, let's go with uh, Devon versus Jerome Ford, who had a great game in place of Nick Chubb. Yeah, great game. Um, found the end zone a couple times, right? Like, we really liked Jerome Ford all season. These, It's funny, these two guys over the past two weeks have been the two, like, just push all your chips in in terms of fab bidding um, on the waiver wire, right? I'd, I'd probably go A-chan here because um, it's not like he has some terrible matchup. But yeah, Listen, with players tied to Miami, we're probably not even going to look at matchups all season because that offense can put 40 on anybody. But Buffalo is allowed, you know, almost six yards per carry on the ground this year. Um, it's not going to take a lot of touches for A-chan to make some noise here. So slight lean to him. I just expect a really low score in that Cleveland-Baltimore game. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, actually. So let's get one more in here. A-chan versus Alexander Madison. Now, Again, the Vikings may not be good, but some of their players are playing well. Yeah, really tough with Madison though, because like he had a he had a nice yardage total last week, um, but it was a sneaky bad game overall. Like if you were if you were watching this thing, you didn't come away feeling any better about Alexander Madison. Um, he's got ball security issues, and now. Uh, he's got Cam Akers issues. They're they're talking about Cam getting on the field this week. So I I don't trust Madison at all, regardless of matchup. I think I'm going to go HN here as well. Yeah, I, look, it's interesting because I think we can just be real here. HN is really tricky to figure out. I loved him coming in to the draft because of his speed and because of everything he did in college. But how they end up sharing all of, there's only so many plays in a game, right? Like there's only so many touches for this Miami offense. So I don't know if it's going to end up being feast or famine week to week, right? Like HN seems like it makes a ton of sense. He makes a ton of sense, but in some ways it also seems like he doesn't. Yeah. Listen, you heard, you heard Austin talk about it earlier, right? Like he's, he's really small. I mean, not, you know, like there are other small backs in the league, but there's not a lot of guys out there who are like five, eight and a half and one eighty five. Um, players like that don't generally see 22 touches like, like HN did last week. So I don't know that that's a role that he can actually fall into and maintain over the course of a season. But just the possibility that it might happen with Miami is, is enough for us to be interested. Yeah, and if Miami somehow does this to Buffalo, I mean, that's just it's just going to take the hype train to the next mm-hmm. level. If that somehow happens, it will continue, obviously. I think everybody right now is trying to pick him up. Everybody right now is trying to store him. If you've got a keeper league, you're hoping you've got him somewhere where you can hold on to him for a while. But, like, this is one of those things where I could see A-Chan being a huge number one week and nothing for the next month. He's going to be one of those guys that – Every week, you're afraid to look at your bench scoring to realize what you didn't put in. All right, let's bring the whole group back together. Let's get Matt back in here because we have got to get to some hurry up offense. And you guys know what we're going to do here. We're going to put the uh, 25 seconds on the clock. How we feel? By the way, Harmon, have we decided what the little bird is on your shirt? Is that is that a parrot? Is that a is it a peacock? What, 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 is it a peacock? What? It's obviously a cockatoo, pal. Come on, like get your birds straight. <laughs> Okay, I, you know what? I'm not a birdologist, so I, like I, I think that's the official term. <laughs> An orna, ornithologist. Like, okay, a birder, like a birder. He's wearing a little sunglasses. I, I'm just saying. I just, I was just. Someone's kidding. getting a D. Someone's getting a D in this class. Uh, no, nah, that's definitely <laughs> me. Uh, but when you write it, it'll look good. Okay, they've already put the clock up. All right, question number one: Michael Ash, should I start Jameer Gibbs tonight or Ramondre Stevenson? Matt, what do you think? Oh God, I don't know, man. Probably Stevenson. Uh, both these, <laughs> you love that confidence, right? Both these backs are in split backfields, but I'm with Andy that I think Jameer Gibbs is going to take a little bit of a backseat to David Montgomery. I don't think that's happening with Zeke forever for Stevenson. All right, let's get to the next question on the board. George asks, Zay Flowers or Adam Thielen? Andy, what do you think? Yeah, for me, this is A Flowers. Um, by the way, had he been in my class tonight, he would have received an A. I've been super impressed by by Zay so far. I think there's also there's a pretty fair chance that they kind of use Zay Flowers as a little bit of an extension of the run game tonight. So I, I want I want him. I think he goes maybe eight catches, ten catches. Armin, you want to chime in on that? A little disrespect to the grade? We we feeling okay? Yeah, uh, Andy's Andy's just a tough uh, grader. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, He's got high yeah. standards. Tough but fair. Right. That's right. All right, let's go to Brandon here. Brandon asks, Waller or Ingram, non-PPR, hashtag ask FFL. What do you think, Matt? Oh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Your only hope here is that Darren Waller finally returns on his preseason promise. Look, I think the reality is the Giants have faced two of the three best defenses in the NFL. And the Giants, uh, you know, they get the Cowboys in week one. They get the, the Niners last week. That middle game was pretty good for Daniel Jones and Darren Waller against the Cardinals. I think we chased that middle this week. 
Yeah, I, I still love Waller. I, I, I want to root for him every single week. All right, let's get to the next one. I think it's Schmiel. I'm sorry if I'm saying her name wrong. Kittle or Judy at the flex? Assuming Judy's healthy, Laporta is Laporta is my tight end one. What do you think, Andy? <laughs> yeah, he is. Well, pandering, pandering. He's your tight end one. Um, <laughs> obviously, he's your tight end one. I love it. Uh, you know what I love even more is the two Iowa tight end formation. That's probably what I would go with here. Uh, again, like any opportunity to not invest in the Denver offense, I'm, I'm probably going to seize that. I, I, I don't disagree with that, by the way. Uh, question number five. I love I love just the inside jokes we got here. Ryan asks, Travis Etienne, James Cook, Kyron Williams, DeAndre Swift. Harmon, what you think? Oh, I, I think Ryan doesn't need to be writing into our show if he's built this running back room, okay? You, you seem like you got Seriously. some things going on here. Etienne's a lock. Uh, I think DeAndre Swift is a lock. I'm going to go James Cook a little bit over Kyron Williams because, yeah, Kyron Williams like played every single running back snap for the Rams last week. It didn't necessarily go so well, though. Look, uh, maybe it's a two-man league. Uh, that's, uh, that's the only thing I can figure out. Jackson says, start Calvin Ridley, Tank Dell, or Gabe Davis. Andy, what do you think? Man, I, I love all these guys, and I, I wish I had I wish I had your fantasy problems, Jackson. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna play Calvin Ridley here because he's been peppered with targets. Again, I think his quarterback is playing so well, and this has to go right pretty soon. Uh, again, he's had a couple of drops. It's bad. We get really annoyed by players with drops. It's like the Dwayne Bow thing from years ago. But Ridley's good. All right, let's get one more in here for Harmon. And uh, this one comes from Brian Burgers. Love the name. Trevor Lawrence or CJ Stroud? What do you think, Matt? Oh, shout out Brian Burgers here. Um, this one's tough. At the end of the day, I, I do like those Texans receivers. You know, the good matchup there on the outside. But I think CJ Stroud can get sacked a lot and maybe potentially commit a turnover here against a really good Steelers pass rush behind it. You know, like I said, makeshift offensive line. So I'll go with Trevor Lawrence. I agree with Andy. He is playing really well in isolation right now. I, I love the fact that you two like seem like seem like there were a lot of eye rolling to each other. Seems like there's a little little battles going on. Like I love this. We're we're only a quarter of the way through the season, and the heat is just coming off for both of you. I'm all, I'm all in on this. Like I feel like I just get to take my natural spot in the universe as the you know disturber of all things, and I just get to stir you guys up. Let's see how it uh, how it happens. That's one of the joys of hanging out with us every single Thursday. Which by the way, you should do 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time. That's where you can keep up with the latest analysis and projections in the app and check out our podcast at Yahoo Fantasy throughout the week, of course. We're, we're doing great shows in Yahoo Sports in the app and the Yahoo Fantasy app. Go check them out. I strongly recommend the work that we're doing, obviously, because it's great. And check back in Sunday morning for your latest on player injuries and even better, our own Scott Pianowski will be answering your last-minute lineup questions on social media. You can he- keep hitting us up with hashtag ask. FFL. It's the easiest way to do it. Good luck to all your teams in week three. It takes a whole village of people behind the scenes to make this show happen every week. We thank them for the work they put in. For Andy Barons, for Matt Harmon, I'm Jason Fitz. Thanks for hanging out with us on Fantasy Football Live. Come back next week.